Um, let's do it, man. I want to introduce you first on. I have Mike Gore Hickman. Uh, Mike Gore, Gore Hickman bursted on the scene uh, as a trusted advisor to painting contractors all over. He's got a background in marketing. He's well versed. Overall, just a great individual. You're going to get some value for him. Background uh, in painting too. Gonna, Come on. What's that? Background in painting too. Come on. I'm getting there. We've got, we've got a heavy yeah. list of accolades right. here. He's got a painting background, so he's not just a marketing guy who just saw an opportunity. Uh, this guy is an absolute powerhouse. So, uh, Mike, without further ado, man, uh, take good care of my, uh, my, my good friends here. I was going to like do some meetings and like work while uh like the start of the the two presentations yours and austin's and i ended up just like listening to the whole thing it was so good man thank you brother you brought the fire so oh yeah you know how we do uh, is my audio good is it echoey you're fine you're, you're great brother take care of it okay cool so um i this is i just like built this presentation i have never actually done this presentation before i don't even know how long it is um so hopefully we can get through it and hopefully it's not like 10 minutes i don't think it'll be 10 minutes um, but anyway, uh, who here, throw a, throw a number one in the chat. If you've ever, uh, set a goal before. Okay. We got, oh, I see Joe Martinta, my man, a lot of familiar faces, Victor, what's up. All right. We've all set goals before throw number two in the chat. If you've missed a goal by an insane margin, <laughs> it's like, wow, that goal was not possible. <laughs> I don't know how I, how I even did that. So, uh, Tanner, you, you did give me that intro. Thank you for that. Um, previous painting contractor. I was doing just about 200,000 a month by the time I was 21, uh, inflation adjusted. We're in a crazy inflationary environment right now. Um, that'd be about 370,000 a month. Um, cause that was in like, uh, 2013, 2014. So found a paintergrowth.com. Um, in the last two and a bit years, we've helped just about 400 painting contractors. Uh, and it has been, uh, the experience of my lifetime. So thank you guys, Tanner. Thank you for putting this on. Thanks for having me. And I uh, hope that I can bring some fire for you guys today. So if you, um, Tanner, can you put this link in the chat just so people can download the toolkit that I'm going to be going through today? Yeah, so you it. have to put like the HTTPS as well. So HTTPS colon slash slash paintergrowth.com slash liftoff. Um, I have 11 resources for you. <laughs> this is all, these are all typically reserved for my paying clients, um, but I want to give it to you guys today. really want to over deliver. So um, I'm going to be going through all 11 of these today and um, just to kind of help you guys grow up a little bit. That's kind of the purpose. Cool. So imagine getting called for an estimate and this is the house that you get called to quote, <laughs> right? Um, you're like, holy crap, where do I even start? I don't know if drip jobs has a, has a setting for this, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, it's in Montreal. Okay, sweet. Well, anyway, it's wild. So this is why goal setting and planning are important. Like building a business is kind of like painting this. Like there's a million things that you could be doing at any given time, but is what you're currently doing the most effective thing that you should be doing at that time. So my goal of this presentation is to help you become a business owner instead of just being a painting contractor, right? Tanner had a great mindset training um, and really great tactical training before this. Um, but that's really what it's about. We're all here because we want to be business owners. We don't want to be painting contractors. Most of us don't want to be on the tools. Um, we want to scale a business, right? We want to lift, live the lives of our dreams. And so um, you can't do that without systems and processes, which is super sexy, but we'll get there and hopefully we'll have fun doing it. Um, if you do even part of what I recommend today, you're going to be well on that path. So a systematic, processed, goal-oriented performance culture business, right? Let's throw one in the chat again. Does this type of business sound like the type of business you want? Systematic, processed, goal-oriented, performance culture. Okay, sweet. Tanner, you've built an awesome thing here. The, the chat is blown up. This is great. This is a lot of fun. Okay. So we already kind of asked this, who here has missed the goal, right? We've all missed the goal. And, um, and we also have set arbitrary goals with real, with no real plan to hit. I know I've done it. It's like, ah, oh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do $5 million next year. It's like, okay, great. Good for you. But no, you're not right. There's no plan to actually get there. And goals are typically missed when the plan doesn't align with the goal. Um, or when there is no plan, right? We can just throw a goal into the universe and hope we hit it. And maybe like one out of a thousand times we will, cause we'll land that like huge commercial job. that will just like cover our entire year. And we'll be like, Oh, look at all the skill that I have because I landed this $400,000 commercial repaint. But then it comes to next year and it's like, well, I don't know how to do that again. <laughs> so, um, or 
I'm going to work as hard as I can and I hope to hit this random goal I said, right? Because it's not about working as hard as you can. There's that, you know, adage, everyone has 168 hours in a week or whatever, something like that. Um, I don't work that much, but, you know, everyone has the same amount of time, but it's like what you do in that time that will make or break your success, your effectiveness as a business owner and as a, as a business person. Yeah. And all of that. So hopefully we can help you, um, on that path. And as you guys know, hope is not a strategy, right? We want a real strategy, um, real tactics that you guys can execute an action today. So the first step in setting a goal, um, is basically figure out what's important to you. So we can all just set arbitrary goals. I want to do a million dollars in sales. I want to make 200,000, blah, blah, blah. But like, what is really important to you? And it's going to come down to a combination of three things. Um, time. So like, what are you doing with your time and how much time do you have? Um, money. How much of money are you making? How much money are you donating to char- charitable organizations, your church, you're providing for your family, all of that. And impact. What type of impact are you having on your family, on the community around you? Um, And and what type of impact you want to leave um, behind? So goals are typically some sort of combination of these three things. And um, once you work backwards to figure out really what you want, um, you're going to be able to start putting pencil to paper, basically. Um, Once we kind of have an idea of what we want to do with those three things, time, money, impact, then we're going to figure out what the optimal business is for you based on those goals. So let's say that we get to the point where we want to make $200,000 in a year, right? Throw a dollar sign in the chat if you guys would love to make 200k in a year. Jonathan, first one. 200,000, that'd be a good year, hey? It's a great it's a great living. You can you can pay your bills, you can get a nice house, you can buy a new truck, right? But making $200,000 a year can look very different depending on what you want to do. So you can be a part-time painter and let's look at this. So if you're profitable, we're going to look through four scenarios here, four wildly different businesses that all get to that same result of 200K. And this is why goal setting and planning is so important. So if your profit goal was 200,000 and, and then you paint, I think I did the, the budget around 30, 30 hours a week. So you're painting 30 hours a week. You're making 37.5 as a painter. And then you need your business to make the rest of it, 162.5. We tracking so far? We good? Cool. That would basically make you earn 200K. If you have, say, I just put an arbitrary number, about $4,000 a month in overhead, and you're selling, you're using drip jobs, you're closing your jobs at 50% gross margin, um, you need $210,000 of gross margin or $420,000 of revenue. Okay. And basically what that comes down to is about $35,000 a month. So if you can run a tight $35,000 a month business where you're painting 30 hours a week, you can, you know, in theory, take home 200K. Now, if you don't want to paint and you just want to run production sales, and we still have that same $200,000 profit goal, now your business has to earn that whole 200000 right? You're not making money as a painter anymore. So if you have that same $400,000 per month overhead, 50% gross margin, you need now 248000 of gross margin. So just so you guys know, gross margin, I know most of you know, but gross margin is how much each job makes after you pay paint and labor. So your variable costs. So just paint and labor, not talking about fuel or insurance or anything like that. After paint and labor, how much is left over? And we want to try to keep that at 50%, right? That's a healthy business. Um, so in order for this second example, your gross margin needs to be 248000 Quick doubling of that is 4, 496000 in total revenue for the year. Um, and that is averaging 41.3,000 per month of gross revenue being off the tools, right? So you think about that, that's like, that's like three full-time painters, right? So if you can lead three full-time painters and you want to run production sales yourself, you can make 200K, right? That's where I would say most people either are or want to get to. Um, then we're going to the next level of businesses. So you have to bring on a production manager. So profit goal, 200,000. Business earnings, 200,000. Um, but now we have 6,000 6, a month of overhead and a $6,000 per month production manager. So with that same 50% gross margin, our company now needs to make $344,000 of gross margin. And a quick doubling of that is 688,000. But now if you look at what you're doing with your time, You're not running tools. You're not moving ladders. You're not talking to homeowners. You're just doing sales, marketing, and admin. 
So wildly different business. Final, finally, production manager and sales rep, right? For profit goals to 200,000 business earning, we got our 6K overhead, 6K production manager, 40% gross margin instead of 50, because that 10% is going to be going to your sales rep. Now we need that same 344,000 gross margin. That's, oh, sorry, I guess that'd be, yeah, 344,000 gross margin. Yes, because, sorry, this is correct. Um, but at 40%, that brings it to 860,000 total revenue or 71,000 per month. So anywhere from, what was the first example? $27,000 per month to 71,000, actually I have it on the next one. 420,000 a year to $860,000 per year, you can make the same amount of money. Right? It depends what you want to do with your time. So um, throw a, uh, what, what are we going to do? Throw an A in the chat. Like, or has anyone ever thought of their businesses like this before? Like in terms of what you actually want to be doing with your time and reverse engineering your business? Like throw a Y if yes, throw an N if no. Let's do that. Justin, awesome. Sweet. Good stuff, guys. Lots of, lots of Ys, a few Ns. Okay, sweet. So you can just as easily make no money in both versions if you don't have a plan and you don't understand financials. So let's start working backwards with your numbers to figure out your goal. So here's just kind of like some of the resources that are in that toolkit that we're going to be going through. So again, if you go to paintergrowth.com slash liftoff, um, you can download that whole toolkit right now for free. So um, number one, how much do you want to make? Number two, what type of overhead... Um, what type of overhead staff do you want? So do you want a production manager? Do you want sales rep? Do you need administrators? What is your average gross margin, right? And is there potentially opportunity to improve that? Um, what's your average job size? And what is your average closing rate? So if we know these five things, um, we can get started reverse engineering our goal. So we have a goal setting spreadsheet here. And we just have to fill in these items. And so I did fill this in already. We can just do a quick adjustment of it. Um, so profit goal, 200,000. If our monthly overhead is 5,000, production manager, 6,000. Gross margin is 50%. Sales rep, optional, 10%. Average job size, 5,800. Let's say we don't want a sales rep. We're just going to be doing it ourselves. Um, but we do want a production manager. Um, average job size, 5,800. Um, and then if your closing rate is 35%, well, now we're going to get all of the numbers we need for our business. So you guys just take this, make a copy of it. So you got to go file, um, make a copy here. Don't request edit access. I'm not going to give it to you. Just go file, uh, make a copy, and then you'll be able to get right in. And this is basically the breakdown of this business. So if you want a $200,000 with, with business that looks just like this, here's what you need. $664,000 of annual revenue. That's $55,000 a month. 114 jobs at $5,800. 10 jobs per month. Um, 327 estimates per year, 27 estimates per month, 425 estimates per year, 35, sorry, leads per year, 35 leads per month. Cool. So um, just like that, you can put in your numbers once you make a copy and figure out exactly what you need. And so these are great just numbers, but we're going to take it one step further and actually break it down into a week by week business plan. So you're going to take those numbers and input them into this next spreadsheet, which is called the weekly business plan. So if we go back to the spreadsheet here, um, yeah, knowing your numbers is one thing, staying accountable to them each week is another. So, oh, before we go to the weekly business plan, we're going to go to the weekly goal set and review sheet. So in the second sheet here, um, whether or not you have a coach, you should be doing this actively every single week. So what I recommend is just fill this in every Sunday night to reflect on the previous week and make a plan for your following week. So you're going to give your week a rating on just how it went. Any wins, even if you're just celebrating them with yourself and your spouse, right? Um, any key issues and challenges that you ran into, anything that you would have done differently that week, right? We're going to put in last what last week's goals were and last week's results, whether or not we hit or missed them, and then that reason for hitting the miss, hitting or missing them, and then this week's goals, goals, leads, estimate, sales, revenue, and then our plan to hit it. And so I'm going to come back to this concept, but later in the presentation, but like what actions can you take that it will make it unreasonable for you to not hit your goals, for you to miss your goals? So what actions that are within your control can you take that would make it unreasonable that you miss your goals? Then every single week, instead of just deleting it, we, there's actually um, an expandable section here. So you just close your one week, open the next week, update the date. 
So you can start this anytime. And once you're ready to start over, just, you know, duplicate it or whatever. Cool. Um, all right, I'm just going to keep rolling here. So then you're probably wondering, hey, you know, if I have this, uh, this sheet and I'm looking at this weekly, you know, even 30 minutes a week can be huge for your focus. Where do I get these numbers from, right? How do I figure out what, how many leads, estimates, sales, and how much revenue? Oh, there's a little bit of a typo. We're doing it live, guys. We're doing it live. Um, how many leads, estimates, sales, and revenue do I need? And where do I get that? So we're going to flip over to the weekly business plan. And I think I gave this spreadsheet away on the last uh, blast off event, but um, it's just it's just so important, such a vital, vital piece of business. So the numbers that you get pulled from your goal setting sheet here, you're going to put up here. So your, your sales goal, uh, the number of jobs, your average job size, uh, and your sales ratio. So you can leave slippage just at 30% unless you know your slippage. But basically what that means is what percentage of your leads do not turn into estimates. So um, we can just leave that at 30%. That's pretty you know standard for the industry. And then what's going to happen is as you adjust this, your plan will update. So I'm going to update this to 500,000. Every single number updated. So we know how many leads per week we need. We need to know how many cumulative leads we need. And then how many estimates, how many sales, how many book jobs, how many dollars booked. And then we even have production. So the way that this works is it kind of starts slow, um, ramps up, and then slows down again towards the end of the year. So you can adjust that based on your needs. And then based on when you guys want to start this, just update this first date. If you update this first date, all of the rest of the dates will update. Cool. Um, throw a little, you know, uh, Tanner was rocking it with the emojis. Throw a thumbs up if you guys uh, plan on using this and a thumbs down if you don't, because I want to know, like, is this just not hitting? Like, thumbs up if you plan on using this or something like this. Thumbs down if this is a waste of time. Cool. Not a waste of time. Good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um, then, so that's this. We just went through that. So the important thing is not just knowing your goals, but taking the actions needed to actually hit them. So this comes to leading metrics versus lagging metrics. And I'm not sure if you've ever heard of these before, but leading metrics are basically the, like something that you control. Lagging metrics is something that is a result of a leading metric. So a leading metric that you, something that you can control is how many estimates do you do, right? That is something that is like actively within your control. You can go out, you can pound the pavement, you can do more marketing, you can do more Facebook ads, you can get leads, book estimates, you can do estimates, you can control that. But something that you can't control is the amount of dollars that are booked from that, right? You can know averages and you can break that down, but you can't guarantee that you can book $10,000 next week if you don't, um, you know, even if you have 10 estimates lined up, you can't guarantee that you'll book 10 grand because they might all be small jobs. It's not something that's within your control. So we want to focus on the leading indicators um, and the lagging indicators being basically our business goals. So leading you control lagging, you don't control. So again, do the actions that would make it unreasonable for you not to hit your goals. I get that from, I got that from uh, Hormozy, uh, the goat. He is a big man um, upstairs in my books. So um, that's one something he says. Um, and I love it. If anyone knows Hormozy, then you absolutely get it. Uh, let your weekly goals define your actions for the week and then make it unreasonable for you not to succeed based on your actions. Do not become passive and just hope for your leads and estimate goals to get hit. To achieve aggressive growth, growth, you cannot just wait for the phone to ring, right? You want to make it ring. And a lot of you are here probably because you want to talk about lead generation. We're going to talk about that. So now that you know your numbers, or at least after this session, I hope you like have an hour scheduled so you can sit down, go through these templates and actually use them. Because otherwise, um, actually, another thing that Hormozy says is that if you, for you to learn something, what, what learning means is same input. Uh, different response. So if you don't like for you not to learn something would for, would be for you to go back to your business and do the same thing you were doing before. Same input, same response. But for you to have learned something, same input, you change your actions, different response, right? That's what I hope that you do today as you learn something and change your actions based on what I tell you today. So now that you know your numbers, now you need to know how to hit those numbers. Leads. Okay. What actions should you be taking to hit your leads goal? 
Um, and yeah, quick plug. This is the main thing that we help with is leads and sales. Um, we do a lot in recruiting and systems and, and, and business building as well. But um, client Jonathan, great dude. Uh, since joining Blueprint, we tripled in 12 months. So that was pretty cool. Um, there's a text I got yesterday. So I thought I'd bring that uh, in. So you want to have multiple lead sources, right? Marketing teams. Actually, before I do that, what you should not do is sit back and wait for the phone to ring, right? <laughs> it's like, why is my phone so quiet, right? I have GLSAs going. I have an ad in the newspaper. Like I'm, I should have referrals calling me, right? But that's not the case. I mean, that strategy can maybe keep you and a, a, a helper busy or a couple of painters. But if you want to scale your business, if you want to hit like that 860K that we had on the screen or million dollars plus or 2 million or 3 million, um, just ask some of these guys who are actively doing this right now, do, do you have that much just coming in, right? Like Jason Paris or, or Brad Ellison or even Tanner, right? They're doing aggressive outbound marketing <laughs> from multiple channels. So we want to have marketing teams, right? I'm a big proponent in, in hiring salespeople to go door to door. Like that's an amazing strategy in most markets. Um, flyers, and we're going to get into flyers in a couple of minutes here. Huge opportunity. I know, I know Jason Paris, he's, he's doing most of his revenue from flyers. And like, that's like millions and millions a year. Uh, door hangers. And um, we can talk about that as well. Job site marketing, lawn signs, strategic partners, Facebook ads, Google lead service ads. Magic letters, Logan, you got it. That's a that's a secret for inside the group though, Logan. So we're going to keep that one under wraps. <laughs> um, two sources of failure in the marketing plan. Those who rely on one or two lead sources for their business and those who advertise as generalists. Right, and I'll get into this here. Um, okay, sweet. Uh, a little technical glitch there. So we want to use a niche or niche marketing strategy to generate more leads per campaign. One of my least favorite words, just because it's niche, niche, I don't like that word, but I like the concept of it a lot. <laughs> so um, we want to do that, right? We want to niche down. Whether the campaign is based around hardy siding, interiors, decks and fences, or whatever whatever type of marketing, whatever type of job you want to attract at that certain type time of year, you want to create specific niche down campaigns and, and uh, um, marketing initiatives for those um, for those specific services. So, if you build campaigns around a niche, you'll actually get greater results than if you say you do it all. Right? You do not want to say, and I know that every single one of you pretty much without fail has said this, we are specialists in interior, exterior, residential, commercial decks, fences, cabinets, doors, wood siding, vinyl siding, aluminum siding. We paint brick, we do whitewashing, we do blah, 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 and we'll even fix your toilet, right? <laughs> Customers don't want to buy that, right? If they're having, if someone has a nice home and they want to invite you into their home to paint their nice walls or their whatever, their ceilings, like they don't want to hire someone who's also going to be slapping stain on a deck, right? They want to know that they're bringing on the person who can handle their job. So a specialist <laughs> if it doesn't move, we'll throw paint at it. Exactly. So um, think about your, your own home. I, if many of you rent, but it, I mean, or if you do own a home, um, renting is a great financial strategy right now in this housing environment. Are you kidding me? But anyway, so um, if you own a home, and you uh, are looking to get your roof replaced, right? You, it's a big investment, right? You're looking at like 20 plus thousand dollars to get your roof done. Now, are you going to call the guy who on his ad, it, said, and it says they do aluminum roofs and, and commercial roofs and residential roofs and industrial roofs. And they also will do tin and siding and gutters. And they'll also do painting and they'll mow your lawn while they're at it. Or are you going to call a company that just does asphalt shingles? Right. And that's all they do every single day. Right. I don't know about you, but I would personally call the company that's a specialist in what I'm looking for, even if it's 20% more expensive, because I know my job's getting taken care of. That's what their specialty is. So if I got a piece of marketing from them and I was in that like buying window and all I saw was pictures that looked like my house with before and afters of the type of asphalt singles my house has, probably more likely to call them than the one that has pictures of like, a, I don't know, a green, green bin or whatever that they just resheeted. So um, here's an ad that I, uh, I pulled. Um, can't remember got this. Maybe the painting contractors group, 
but uh, does this look like anyone's ads? <laughs> does this just, um, uh, you know, ooze confidence in my company? So this is what we want to get away from, right? So I actually just threw this one together on uh, on Canva. So if anyone's not using Canva right now, it is the best way for you to get graphic design done professionally by yourself for like no money. This took me literally like seven minutes. So cabinet painting specialists in Sterling Heights. So picked a random community. Um, we have a client there, so it was top of mind. Um, we are cabinet painting, painting specialists located right here in Sterling Heights. Um, we're offering 15% off all cabinet painting projects book before January 31st, exclusively for Sterling Heights residents. Part art, part science. Creating your cabinets painted. Did you know that painting your cabinets can renew your look? Blah, blah, blah. Spots are limited. Call text today. Canva. Yes, canva.com. Cool. So which one do you guys think would perform better? <laughs> number one or number two? Right. I think, I think we can kind of agree that too. It's not even just that it's designed and it looks kind of cleaner, but if we want cabinet jobs and we're a business that we know we can, we have a system for cabinet jobs, we can crank them out. Um, we have great profit margins. We know we can provide a great customer experience then why not dig into that, right? Why try to be a jack of all trades? It's like, oh, maybe I'm leaving something on the table by not getting a, I'm missing out on some decks. Well, that's not what we're going after right now. And the really cool thing about it is um, you're not pigeonholing your company, right? If you send out a campaign directed at kitchen cabinets one week, and the very next week you send out a uh, direct mail campaign into the same set, a subset of homeowners about wood siding as a wood siding specialist, there will be exactly zero people that remember that you sent that cabinet one week before. <laughs> homeowners do not think about you <laughs> at all. So if a flyer comes into their head and they're in that buying window or they're close to that buying window, maybe they'll throw it on their fridge or maybe they're ready to call right now. But if they're not in that buying window, they're going to throw it away. And that's fine. Most people are going to do that. But we're trying to find those people in that buying window and create enough trust and credibility in that like one second of attention that they give us. And that's why specializing is important. Um, and we want to create a flyer, a flyer and campaign on the seasonal service that you're currently looking for. So right now, a lot of the country is having winter. So we want to look at interiors. We want to look at cabinets. So let's start planning some, some niche um, campaigns around those services. And then you can alternate them in series as well. Clients have a short memory, right? Like if you had a... A plumbing company, and they mailed you a water heater special. And then the next week, they mailed you a furnace special. Like, do you think you'd put it together that was the same company? Probably not. <laughs> anyway, um, testing marketing also requires a ton of volume, right? I'll have some people coming out and saying, Hey, I put out 500 door hangers and I didn't get one call. It's like, okay, well, that's hardly a test. Um, you should really be testing campaigns with at least 5,000 pieces, whether it's door hangers or direct mail pieces, and then assess your results from there. Ideally, you're doing some sort of tracking, some sort of link tracking or phone call tracking on your direct mail so that you can see what's coming or any marketing, direct mail, Facebook, so that you can identify your lead source and thus attribute it. And we're actually going to go into lead source attribution here in a second. Um, and if you follow these principles, they should provide you a significant return. Uh, track the data and make business decisions off of it. So with marketing tracking, you're only as good of a leader as the decisions you make. So those decisions that you make are only as good as the data you have. So, uh, oh, do I have one second? Did I? Okay, sweet. So also, I'm, I should have just out of order. Anyway, stacking your marketing. I want to layer all the marketing together, right? We don't want to just rely on one thing. That's huge problem I see a lot of contractors doing is they're just doing Facebook ads or they're just doing GLSAs and they're wondering why they're not working, right? We want to layer our marketing on top of each other to be omnipresent, right? We want to be a big fish in a small pond. So I was talking to a client yesterday there in Chicago. So she's like, how do I tackle Chicago, right? How do I just like become known in Chicago? Where do I get jobs from? It's just like so overwhelming. So we talked about it and we looked at her map and we found a basically community of about a hundred thousand people that was close to her house that had great income. And um, we're going to focus in on targeting that. So if she could, you know, be seen six, seven times by all of those 100,000 people, instead of trying to market all of Chicago, 
she's going to have a lot healthier business because she's not going to be driving all over the place. Clients are going to see her signs more frequently. And uh, there's going to be, you know, repeat buyers and word of mouth. So um, just an example of stacking and layering your marketing. So before you start a project, do some hyper-targeted Facebook ads just in the zip code of that one, uh, that one area. Um, we're going to throw up a lawn sign day one or a week before. We're going to do door hangers day two. We're going to have a marketer go door to door day three. And then we're going to clean up on leads, clean up with leads on day four. So we love stacking marketing. Um, way more effective when you can layer a whole bunch of strategies together. Um, Tanner, when do I have till? 10, uh, 11.30? Yeah, you got time for a Q&A after as well. Okay, I still got, I still got a bunch to go. We're just, we're just getting started. <laughs> I think we got a bunch left. I can't remember. Um, so this is a lead source dashboard, and um, it's the fourth uh, spread, uh, the fourth uh, sheet in this document. And essentially, what you want to do is every month, as the month is going, track in the cost of each marketing effort, the number of leads that you get from each source, the number of estimates you get from each source, the number of jobs, and the total job value. So, for example, if on Facebook we spent a thousand dollars. We got 30 leads. We're at a 33, 33 cost per lead. Say we did 15 estimates, 66 bucks an estimate. Say we landed five jobs. And then that total job value was, um, let's say 16,540. Cool. So average job size, 3380. These should have a little number sign there. And then the ROI should just come down like that. So we have a... 1600% ROI on our Facebook ads because we spent a thousand and we booked 16,000. And so as throughout the month, you want to do that for every source. Obviously, some of them won't have any costs associated with it, like referrals, word of mouth, and that's great. Um, but this is going to help us see where we should be investing more money in and what's working, what's not working. Cool. Um, super important. Um, we do lead source tracking and painter growth. We actually have an automated system that's cool. My like developer built a whole backend system that tracks everything, but it's some of the best data that you can get is by analyzing your lead sources and seeing where things are coming from. Um, if you think back to the start of my presentation, my goal was for you guys to help become business owners and make decisions as true business owners, not as painting contractors, right? Not as the painter who's trying to start a company, but as someone who runs a million dollar, $5 million, $10 million business, what do they do? How do they look at data? How do they make decisions? And every single one of those business owners looks at lead sources and which lead source is effective and which isn't. So if you can start doing this, even if you're doing 100, 200, 500,000 a year, this is going to help you scale 100%. All right. Sales. Tanner did an incredible job with sales. I'm going to do a quick crash course. Just try to simplify things a little bit, give you a few resources. So if you want to make sure you're closing your estimates, do everything that Tanner said, but also um, just a quick little checklist. Lights out setup call. We'll go into that. Automated email, text reminders, show up exactly on time. Perfect estimate, which I'll take you through. Um, trial close and sell the deposit. Those are kind of my uh, uh, recommendations. And then I guess we also have handle objections too. Um, and uh, all of that is on some resources I'm giving you guys today. So number one, lights out setup call. So what is this before the estimate? So when you're scheduling the estimate or the night before the estimate, if it was an auto schedule, you're calling the homeowner and you're taking them through this process. And the purpose of this is to get them excited about the estimate and to get to reposition it from a... Um, uh, from a painting estimate where they're just getting a price to a buying decision appointment where you're prepping them so they become ready to make a buying decision. And you can do that ahead of time. So you're not springing them on something like, oh, like you're expecting a decision today. I didn't know that. We need to think about it. Well, we want to avoid those, right? So introduction, project details, history, process, like what is your process? Any decision makers, right? If there's a spouse involved, we want to know this up front. Um, some rapport, logistics, and then asking for the job. This is huge. So once I come for the estimate, if you're comfortable with me and the price is within your budget, will you be ready to schedule time to have the work done? Right? Are you ready to book in? Or are you just tire kicking? Right? Oh, we're just getting a price. We're not even serious about painting. Okay, well, we don't just come out to give prices. Call us back when you're a little closer to your project and we can come give you a quote then. Right? Save you time. And then... Um, Closing, restate the estimate time, and then um, 
yeah, it's it's just really good. So in that toolkit, uh, we have the perfect estimate. So we actually, uh, yeah, we have the latest setup call, but then also the perfect estimate. So once you get there, right? How do you structure your estimate? So we have video and two templates, cheat sheet, worksheet, and a video. Basically, um, yeah, so how we do it, we uh, show up exactly on time, obviously super important. A little um, pro tip that we've had, if like if you're running one minute late, if you know that you're going to be knocking on the customer's door at least it, it, one minute late, you call them. Hey, Mary, I'm going to be one minute late for the estimate. I'm so sorry about that. Oh, give me a minute. No, don't worry about that. That's totally fine. Just a minute. Like, all right, see you soon. Excited to see you. We actually have some clients that are purposely um, trying to be a minute late for their estimate so that they can make that call because of that rapport that it builds, which is pretty hilarious. Um, but it's so great. It like builds that rapport because if you're treating their time with that much respect, you know, they can just extrapolate how they're going to, how you're going to treat the rest of their project. So don't just be like, Hey, I'll be there between five and six. Like no, no one likes that. Homeowners don't like that. Right. Build the experience, be a courtyard seat. Love that analogy, Tanner. So, um, before, um, before talking about the project and doing a walkthrough or walk around or anything, we want to get to that kitchen table, right? That's the goal. We're going to ask them about their needs, their previous experience with contractors. Um, and then project scope. Once we get into that section, we're going to start walking through the home, explaining our process uh, and future pacing the client as if they've already made their decision. Okay, great. Where can we put our tools? Okay, we'll put our crew kit right over here. We're going to be covering plastic on all of these things. You know, you move your little small things, we'll move all the big furniture and like just future pace with your language that you've already uh, sold the job and you're already going to be doing the work. Once you've... Um, once you've done that, then you're going to want to, once you finish your walkthrough and you have a good idea of what's going to be painted, now we're going to do a trial close. All right, Deborah, I'm going to go back to my car to write up your proposal. It should take me about 20 minutes. Do you mind if I come back in when I'm finished? Okay, cool. Sounds good. So what you're doing is again, you're future pacing, you're writing it and you're presenting on the spot. We're not emailing the quote afterwards, right? We're going back in and we're going to present it because we're going to walk away with a deposit. And then in your car, you're going to go through. And the really important thing here is that you write down the important things that they told you at the kitchen table. Maybe they have a dog, maybe they have kids, maybe they had a roofer that left nails all over. So job site cleanliness is really important, right? So put that on the proposal. What was important to them that is not associated with the painting project? <laughs> um, and then uh, when it comes back in, knock lightly, open the door, enter, announce yourself. Who comes in? Who comes in? Who opens doors with, um, in people's homes? friends and family. So if you can be perceived as a friend, super helpful tip. And then your goal is to get back to that kitchen table to discuss the details, um, build value, present the price, ask for the job and sell the deposit. So what I mean by that, great. The project's $10,000. Uh, in order to secure your spot, uh, we just require 20%. Actually, I have a slide coming over that. We just require 20% down. That's $2,000 uh, to get you confirmed. How would you like to handle that deposit? And then you shut up. <laughs> so um you have the job you build value throughout the job um sell to the specific needs and then uh close with the deposit because that's all you're asking for it's a lot easier to make a two thousand dollar buying decision than a uh ten thousand dollar buying decision um here's another example all right mary the total cost of your project is eight thousand four sixty five um to get booked in our schedule we take a 20 percent deposit so that's only 1693 how would you like to handle that And they say whoever talks first loses. So you just literally wait. <laughs> um, yeah. And then shut up. So cool. So that's basically selling deposit. Um, Justin, you really love like number seven. Yeah. That's the uh, number seven was the knocking and entering, I think. So um, yeah. Thanks, Tanner, for posting it. If you guys want all of these templates um, that I'm sharing here, go to paintingbrowth.com slash liftoff. Sales outcome tracking. Another super important uh, part of it. And so few people do this. This alone can double your close rates. Um, and this is the sales tracking dashboard that I'm sharing with you guys. Uh, this is super valuable. So essentially what this is, is you're going to be tracking your sales rate month over month. Um, you're going to put in every estimate that you do. I have a couple examples. And it's going to automatically calculate up here and automatically calculate on your dashboard. So if you have a sales rep, you're going to give them a copy of this. If you're just doing them, you're going to fill this in as you go. But basically, so we have on the fifth, we did John Evans, Facebook. He's from Facebook. Um, the outcome is pending. The objection is spouse. 
and then we can put the deals up the details here. Um, on the sixth, we had Richard. Um, source was Google. One deposit, no objection. We had fifty six thirty revenue and an eleven twenty six deposit. So we put all those things in. We have our bookings per estimate, our revenue, our cash collected. How many won? How many follow ups? How many lost? What our close rate is? Total sales? Total deposits? And then our estimate information here: scheduled, canceled, cancellation rate, rescheduled, attended slippage, and uh, all of that will appear in the dashboard, so you can track your metrics month over month. Who here thinks this would be helpful? Just throw a thumbs up. Omar, Omero, need this so much. Awesome. Yeah. Cool, guys. Well, uh, this too can be yours. All you need to go do is go to the link and download it. Hey, Ido. Nice. We got Ido here. Sweet. Lots of familiar faces or names, I guess. All right. Um, production math. So um, if we go back to the weekly business plan, we're going to determine your hourly charge rate. So right now, um, you guys should hopefully know your approximate hourly charge rate. I know Drip Jobs um, does a good job of this. Um, it should be somewhere between 65 and 85, probably a little bit higher on the higher end of that, I would say right now, um, just with the economy and everything and the, and the price, prices of everything. Um, and you want to basically calculate how many painters you're going to need ahead of time uh, based on about 36 hours of production per week per painter. Um, plan your recruiting efforts ahead of time so you don't get caught um, without enough guys or gals. And uh, that's in the weekly business plan. So we're going to go back here to the weekly business plan. And if we go down into um, dollars produced, we can see how much per week we're planning to produce based on our goal. So let's go back up and let's go to 860 again. So that's our goal this year. And again, it starts off slow. One thing I didn't show you is that in this trends here, um, you can actually change the, these numbers in the gray. Uh, and this is how much is booked and how much is produced each week of the year. So 52 weeks in a year, you're about 2% per week um, as a fraction of the year. So you can adjust this. We kind of start with 1%. We go to 2, up to 3, and then back down to 2, and then over the holidays, uh, 1, and then a couple weeks at 0. So you can adjust that based on your year. But um, if we go down to the weekly production, and we see that in this section, so from April until um june here we're we're budgeting three percent per um week to produce so it's twenty five thousand eight hundred. so if we just open up a calculator here and we go twenty five thousand eight hundred divided by a charge rate of say 85 dollars, that's 303 labor hours per week and if we take that and divide that by 36 hours per week um, cause that's approximately how many hours of production each painter can produce. We're looking at 8.4 painters. So I'm just going to reduce those. So it's a little bit easier. So labor hours per week and then painters needed. So 8.4 painters. If you have a couple rock stars, you can probably get that done with eight. If you have, uh, if you know some of your painters are a little bit slower, maybe you need a few more, maybe you need to sub out a few jobs. But what that does, that just gives you a little bit of knowledge ahead of time, looking at your business plan, how many painters you're going to need to make sure that you can execute on the production side of it, right? Because booking booking work is one thing. Uh, producing work is a completely different thing. Cool. So we're at the recap. I think this is pretty good on time here. So for the recap here, guys, we uh, talked about goal setting. Right. So hopefully that was valuable to understand kind of how to set a better goal, what's important to you, ways to get to $200,000 per year, um, finding your number and working backwards, following a weekly business plan, doing reflect, doing weekly reflection and goal setting. Right. We talked about that GSR weekly um, goal setting, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> just like a little spreadsheet here to keep you on track week after week. Um, we talked about marketing strategies and layering your marketing. We talked about lead tracking and lead source tracking and figuring out your return on investment per lead source. We talked about some sales strategies and we had a few specific tactics that you could execute. Um, we talked about close rate tracking. Are you not entertained? <laughs> Was this enough value for you guys today? I tried to kind of lay it all out on the table. Um, so, uh, Give me a thumbs up if you guys have at least seven things to implement after this. <laughs> Sweet. Hey, Javid. Nice. Brett. Awesome, guys. 
So don't forget your toolkit, paintergrowth.com slash liftoff. And one more thing, because I wouldn't be doing respect to my business if I didn't at least um, give you guys something special as a final parting gift um, that uh, can hopefully help the really serious ones take your business really to the next level. So if you got value from today, but you feel like you might want some help putting it all together, making sense of it all, getting a custom plan, getting some accountability, um, I've actually opened up five discounted coaching spots to work with me over the next 90 days. So if you're like 2024 is the year, I'm going to take my business seriously. I need a coach. I need to set this thing up. Um, for the next 90 days, you're going to get my entire playbook, sales, marketing, recruiting systems, finances, weekly support and coaching, hundreds of templates, huge library of training content, accountability, personalized guidance, and handholding, problem solving, and of course, our wonderful community. And uh, this is just a post um, just from uh, yesterday. Dustin, I'm not sure if you're on here, but um, thanks for this post. I love it. Um, Elijah just re reached out to me directly. Um, this is your secret sauce, the community. Let's go. I feel so encouraged. So again, that was, that was yesterday or the day before, but I love it. Love seeing things like that. The community is uh, that we have uh, at Painter Growth is really something else. So if you go to paintergrowth.com slash liftoff and just scroll down, you can book a call with my team. Like I said, we're just keeping, uh, we have five discounted spots available um, for you guys today. So if you're serious about it, 2024 is the year, then let's go. That's it, guys. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. Any questions? Awesome, guys. Let's do a Q&A. We have a few minutes and then we got Jason coming up. So drop your questions uh, in the Q in the uh, in the Q&A thing. It's the easiest way for us to see uh, what's you know, what you guys are asking. So um, let's do that. And then we will uh, we will transition. So uh, first of all, Mike, bringing value as always, guys, painter growth. Here's the deal. I, I don't know if you guys listen to my podcast, but when you hear me talk about Mike and painter growth, let me tell you and Mike will be the first to say this in coaching, like community is one of the most valuable things you're going to get. And I don't think you hit on that hard enough, Mike. I don't think you, I don't know, you might've touched on it, but I just want to let you guys know that aside from all of the accountability, they have such a great community. I've been in that community and I've never seen more people show up to a coaching call ever. And, uh, and that just is a testament to what you built there. So imagine having people that you can connect with on a daily basis that can guide you. And here's the cool part. Community coaching is so cool because someone might ask a question that you don't have, you don't, you didn't even think to ask, and you're getting benefits from the answers to those questions, guys. Um, so love Mike, love what he's doing. We got some questions rolling in Mike. Um, yeah. So we had, um, to answer your, uh, your question. I mean, we actually have a coaching call today. Um, we have our weekly call. We have a huge announcement that we're making on today's call, but like we are expecting like between 50 and 60 to show up live on our, on our like big weekly call. And then we have a whole bunch of other calls um, littered throughout the week, depending on what you really need help with. But yeah, this is pretty cool. Yeah, I love it. Um, you know, I'll start, you know, just to kind of to warm up the audience here, Mike. You know, you have a company that comes in and wants to do coaching, but they're a solo painter. Like you'd think that like some, some people, you know, who want to do coaching generally are scaling and they're just in that in between stage. Investing in coaching is hefty. You know, let's just be honest. It's an investment. I mean, you can expect that, but what, how do you, how do you handle those uh, smaller operations? Uh, we love small businesses. I mean, we work with some big businesses too. I think our biggest clients doing just about a million a month. Um, but uh, our vast majority of clients are kind of between that you know, hundred, like even getting started, like literally people just getting started to 500, 600 K. We got a plan for you. we got a few different things that we do, but um, it's all about going back to the basics, right? Some of these big clients as well, they need the exact same things that a brand new business needs. They got, you know, they got to 500 K, 700 K, not all by luck, but with the reputation, just by doing some, you know, doing what they know how to do. They want to take it to the to a million. A lot of the exact same things that a a start a business in 100, 200 K needs to get to 600. Right. right. So it, it's all fundamentals. It's all progressive. And, and we have a plan for you. We have incredible coaches. We have a couple eight figure coaches that, that are on the team. And um, yeah, depending on what you need, whether it's leads, whether it's sales, whether it's, you know, team subs, um, just better organization. We got you. 
Love it. What is that? Like, what is the first week of a coaching program look like? Like, I mean, ultimately you make the investment and it's like, does the magic just start happening? Like, do, like, what is that? Like, how do you, how do you, um, how do you launch someone in, in, into a different direction? Cause that's really what you're doing initially. So can you walk? Yeah. That? I mean, a lot of you guys have probably seen my leads with my ads, right? We're like, Oh, book, like guaranteed books work. Right. And so when we talk about guaranteed book work, a lot of people think that that just means, Oh, they're going to, you're going to come to the program and we're immediately going to go after leads. Right. Um, and this is where we do a little bit of a rug pull <laughs> because it's not everyone just needs leads. A lot of businesses need infrastructure. And if we were to just give them systems that brought them 50 leads, they would explode. They wouldn't do it. The leads would go stale, like, and they wouldn't get the actual result. So we start with, we start with like a lot of what we did here, goal setting. We go in a lot more detail and personal accountability and planning and schedule management and time management and, and, um, productivity. We do all that. We get all that basics out of the way, right? Systems implementation. And then we get in the lead flow and delegating and building a team of, of marketers and, and a whole bunch of different marketing strategies. Um, like Logan just posted here, we've been working with him not even for that long. Um, I'm a solo painter through Mike's system. I booked enough work to hire a full time guy in February with five weeks booked. So that's, you know, kind of like what we do. <laughs> does that I make got sense? A question. It does. Um, so, okay, this is a pretty, pretty good question. Like, all right, so Justin's asking, like, your, your ideal coaching client, like, what kind of attitude? characteristics do they have coming in? Cause I'm sure you get people that say, all right, Mike, here's your money. Freaking figure it out for me. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you so, know, but, so, so what is that? What is that? What is that requirement? Like in terms of somebody's personality, where they're at, where they're at in their life to really get the yeah. most out of it. So we did, um, we used to do agency stuff. We used to do Facebook ads for clients. We used to do Google ads for clients, but it attracted the wrong types of clients. And I'm sure Austin will tell you, Eric will tell you, being an agency owner is, it's not easy to run a marketing agency because every single month you're expected to get leads. If you get leads for 20 months in a row and then the 21st month, you don't, you miss your leads expectations, clients are out, right? And I hated that relationship. Even if we were really great at marketing, I hated that, you know, that arms crossed, get me leads. Like that's not the type of client that I want to work with. That's not the type of people I want to be around. So typically the type of person who's interested in coaching is I think by all, by a lot of means, the type of people who are spending two days in an online seminar like this to learn who want to generate knowledge or like build knowledge and who want to um, provide positive impacts in their business, who want to become better people, better business owners, better leaders within their communities. And that's the type of person we want. Someone who comes in and says, how can we do this together? Okay. I tried this one system that you taught me exactly how you taught. It didn't work. So what did I do wrong? Or how can we try again? Right? Like that type of open-minded testing mentality rather than like, Oh, I tried this. It didn't work. I quit. Right. We can't, we don't want to work with, we don't want to work with toxic people. We don't want to work with um, victims. If you're a victim, everything is your, if everything is, nothing's your fault, please do not apply. <laughs> but if you're like open-minded and you want to build a business and you want to be positive and you know, you can do it, you know, you can build a big, bigger business than what you currently have. And you have that like, that like fire inside you. Like I have what I call the entrepreneur's curse, where I just live with a rock in my stomach all of the time because I know my business should be bigger than it is. <laughs> I don't know if any of you guys can resonate with that, but I like, it's always in me. And it just, yeah. when my business is doing 10 K a month to like multiple hundreds of thousands a month, like it's always there. It's like, it should be bigger. It should be bigger. And if you have that fire inside you, then this is for you, right? If you're just like, I'm okay, status quo, maybe I can get a few more jobs go hire an agency. That's fine. Right. <laughs> but if you have that hunger, that fire, that burn, you, you want to know exactly what you can do to scale quickly. Like, let's go. That's what we're all about. Guys, raise your hand. I'm going to let in some audio questions. If you find that little hand raise thing, uh, on your zoom panel, I'll be able to bring you up here. You could, you can just ask him like a question. Um, um, while you're doing that, I'll answer John's question here. So should we be charging 85 per hour per man hour on the job? And then do we do 50% gross margin? So how that works, John, is that if you take, so you price your job with labor, with materials, with your overhead, and you get your total price for the job, say it's $10,000. You divide that by how many labor hours you think it's going to take to produce that job. So say it's a hundred hours. So $10,000 job, yeah, $10,000 job, hundred hours. That's a hundred bucks an hour all in, right? So that should include your 50% margin. Does that make sense? 
he can't talk back, but I'm sure. Yes, it does. He could like do a thumbs up or something, but cool. <laughs> there you go. Give him, give him a thumbs up. Um, Nestor, it looks like I got your hand up, brother. So I'm going to go ahead and bring you up. I don't know if it was a, a butt hand or, or what, but we'll give you a shot here. Nestor, you're in. Might be, a, it might be, a, it might be a butt hand. I don't think he's here or he, he didn't know that he hit the button. So, so Mike, you know, I kind of want to wrap it up with uh, a little, you know, kind of like a little, a little bit more value in terms of, you know, I know we're going heavy on signing up for the coach program, but, you know, really, I mean, when we talk about sales, it's about value. My talk was about value in excess of a coaching program, right? In, in excess of drip jobs, what's the value? You got the community, the free trainings, the onboardings, the constant innovation, the connectivity to the guy who's in charge of it. Like, I think that's valuable to some people to where they would justify paying a little more, right? What's the value that Painter Growth offers in a way that makes someone say, hey, I have two coaching programs I'm considering. What's the value that you guys offer that you feel is in excess of uh, and just a coaching program? Yeah. I mean, I haven't been through the other coaching programs, right? I basically built my program over the last couple of years to be what the tools that I wish I had when I was starting my business, when I was trying to grow my business. Um, I saw some you, some Facebook comments the other day that said on a coaching thread, that's like, you don't need to get a coach. You can just find it all on YouTube. Right. And this is absolutely true. You can find anything that you want to do on YouTube, but the problem is going through and filtering what's good information and what's bad information. Right. So what we basically do is like we filter through all that for you. We figure out what's good, what's bad, and we just deliver to you exactly what you need to do in a custom plan for your business. Um, but that's not really the, the big part. The, the, the information is one thing, but it's the implementation support that is the big thing. So you tried something. It didn't work. How do I adjust it for my community? I do this type of job. How do I create a campaign just for this? I don't have time to do this. Can you connect me with a good designer? Like, yes. Right. Let's save time. Right. In this world, we have two things. We have time and we have money. So how can we use one to get the other? When you have a lot of time and no money, we, you want to work for money. You work hourly. But when you have money and you have a job, that you know, a business that pays you well, now you're trying to figure out how to use that money to get your time back. It's just a constant struggle. So we want to help you maximize that relationship between time and money based on where you want your business to go. That was pretty ethereal, but I hope that makes sense. I'm working with a marketing company right now, but they don't offer some of the things you mentioned. Is that a conflict of interest? No, absolutely not. Um, we work closely with marketing companies because we don't do marketing. We um, we do we do some things like we'll help you set up your Facebook ads. We'll do a few things like that. We won't run them for you. We'll teach you how to run them. We'll set up, we can give you ad copy and ad creative and show you how to test and show you how to look at data. But if you want someone to do it yourself, we have a few on our short list. So we recommend based on you know, your business size and your goals and stuff. But no, many of our clients work with marketing agencies too. But what our big thing is, is we want to teach you how to, how to like own your marketing, how to get your own leads without relying on an agency, without relying on anyone else to bring it on the team internally to do it for you. Um, it's not for everyone, but if that's something that you want to do and you want to just be in control of it, then that's what we do. Are you an all-in-one system with ads, CRM and coaching, or is it coaching only? And we are to set up our own ads and leads. How's it work? Um, we do not CRM. We don't do CRM. We recommend our clients use drip jobs. Um, but, and we, we, I guess we can, you know, if you have a CRM, you're using drip jobs or something else. Um, we'll really teach you how to do everything else. You don't need an agency. I mean, agencies are great for a lot of things, but you don't need an agency to build a business with us. We'll give you the templates. We'll give you the resources and the coaching on how to implement it yourself or with a team. Beautiful. I got a hand raise. Maybe that Let's was an it. accident. Never mind. Um, guys, another minute or so before we bring up Jason. Uh, I'm going to go through uh, maybe two more questions. Uh, Brett says, do you recommend door to door for quick leads? Um, yeah. One of our strategies is we teach you how to set up what we call a marketing team. Right. So we have a software that we we recommend that teaches you that helps you keep them super accountable so you can pay them per hour plus per lead. Um, and uh, we use that as kind of one of our one of our uh, layers of marketing as you're putting a whole bunch of different things together. So it can be huge. It can be super valuable. We definitely recommend it, but it has to be done right. And we don't want the owner to be doing it. We want it to be uh, really systemized and processed so that you can get out of it as quickly as possible. I'm licensed, bonded, and insured. First year on my own. I'm currently working as a solo painter from referrals alone. 
I've got Google My Business set up and Facebook. How much money should I set aside to begin advertising? Good question, Ben. Um, so what we recommend is like you want to you wanna really budget between 5 to 10% of your goal revenue. You can do it for cheaper, especially if you're doing it yourself. Like if you're, if you're the one that's going to be pounding the pavement, like you can get, like I could go out and book $100,000 of work next month without spending anything. I would just do it myself, right? But if you want to bring on a team, you want to look at 5 to 10% of your goal revenue. So if you're looking to book $100,000, you want to be probably putting aside between five to 10,000 to get those leads and bring in the, that work. It can be less. Like we have some guys, you know, two to 3% of marketing, but in terms of budget, um, just to make sure you have enough, right? Because again, we want to do the things that would make it unreasonable for us to miss our goals. So if we can, if we can spend that 5%, that 7% on marketing with the strategies that we recommend, the strategies that we talked about today, you'll hit your revenue goals. So if you're trying to book 50K, you know, that's like two and a half to five a month. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, awesome. So look, guys, I mean, I think we had a great, uh, great Q&A. Mike, thank you. Can you just give us a refresher on uh, next steps, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. Next steps. Enjoy the next presentation. We've got Jason Phillips up next, who's going to bring the fire. Um, super stoked. Love to listen to Jason. Um, and uh, if you want to work with me, you can shoot me. Actually, if you, if you don't want to book a call, you just want to send me an email. Um, just email me, mike at painandgrowth.com. I'm happy to answer your messages. I'm actually heading out for the next week, but I'll try to get back to you if you get me get to me today. Um, but Tanner, thanks again for putting this on, man. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, I brother, hope you guys got awesome. value from it and awesome. uh, excited to listen to Jason here.